everyone, Terry Welbrock here. Just wanted to take a moment before today's episode to share some exciting announcements. I love to share all my exciting announcements and fun things that are going on in my life. So a couple more narrated audiobooks have hit the shelves. You can check those out. If you go to my website, terrywellbrock.com, you can find uh, different tabs on my website. So there's speaking tabs. So if I've spoken on summits or podcasts, and you can go listen to those. Uh, if you want to know my insights on the world and life. And then um, there's a books tab. And so that will list my audio books and that I've narrated. And there's now seven that are completed, two more in the works. And uh, so if you know of anyone who's written a book or if you yourself has and looking for a narrator, please reach out to me. You can send me an email at info at terrywellbrock.com, info at terrywellbrock.com. Some of the other tabs on my uh, website include the podcast, the Healers of Hilton Head series. There's a tab for that. And the, um, as I'm liking to call it, the financial health tab. So let's talk about some products that I can help you with. I have all kinds of fun stuff from living benefits to mortgage protection to life insurance to uh, college savings accounts for your kiddos, retirement accounts, um, a debt-free life program. Wow, I'm learning about that. And it's one of my favorites. Absolutely amazing. So if you have credit cards, student loans, mortgage, all that fun stuff, we have an amazing, amazing, amazing product to talk about. So Scott's going to be joining me uh, mid-episode to talk a little bit about that, Scott Summers. Uh, here on Hilton Head Island. And uh, so, yeah, you can learn a little bit more about each of those things. All right. Now for today's very informational and educational interview. Welcome, everybody, to the Healing Place podcast. I am your host, Terry Welbrock, and I'm super thrilled to have with me today Constance Sharp, and she is a PhD. She is speaker, educator, researcher, author. And I'm telling you, I loved this intro and I'm going to read this to you because it just, it just, I just thought it was amazing. Award-winning and best-selling author, international mental health educator, and badass leader who helps women become empowered to create meaningful change. She is also the founder of the Institute of Complementary and Indigenous Mental Health Research. So welcome, Constance. Thank you. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be here. Oh, I, I told you before we hit record, I'm I'm excited to learn from you. I know you have a, a recent book that's come out. Um, I do. I so do. Yeah. In, what is the path to God's promise? I think the path to God's that. promise. There it is. Yeah. And it's uh, available on Amazon or uh, by order at any place that books are sold. I love when you support uh, brick and mortar uh, bookstores, especially independent bookstores. Um, but yeah, it's it's available everywhere. Well, good. We'll swing back around to that in a few, um, sure. just because I want to learn. Uh, I love the title of it. It caught my attention when I was when I was stalking your website and checking things out before we came on. Um, so yeah. So gosh, there's so many roles that you that you can you have. Yes. Um, but I'm I'm super curious about what you founded. Uh, can you talk to us about that? Sure. So the Institute for Complementary and Indigenous Mental Health Research is essentially a think tank. It is a loose uh, meeting house um, for uh, mental health researchers and practitioners of all varieties, not just Western educated master's level, but there's a very wide uh, definition of mental health practitioner. Um to get together and share not only best practices um, in mental health applications and uh, interventions, therapeutics, and so forth, but also to widen the definition of what mental health therapeutics look like and what can be implemented in different places around the world. So I just uh, about two weeks ago got back from a research tour in Ecuador. And while I was there, I was with um, many different, both in the Ecuadorian Amazon and up in the Andes, so both extremes, um, with traditional healers there looking at what they do um, for 
people who have mental health concerns. I was even taught how to make ayahuasca, which I was blown away because I was like, I was like, is this is not a closed practice? Well, because they don't have um, the uh, cultural appropriation that you see with native groups here in the United States and in Canada. They were like, no, like you are interested in something that we have, would be happy to share it. And so I really got a lot of insight into this broader definition of mental health and and how we um, facilitate mental health when people don't have access to um, or don't feel comfortable with traditional Western mental health therapeutics. Yeah, I'm so glad that that you're focusing on that approach because I've talked about it so often on this show of the Western medicine approach of let's throw a pill at it. And uh, not that I'm anti-pharmaceutical, but there's so many options out there holistically for for healing. Right. So I mostly work in the realm of complementary therapies. Um, we added, my colleagues and I, we added the indigenous part because I really believe that we need more voices at the table. And people made room for me at their tables. So I um, am a founding member of the Society for Consciousness Studies, which is um, uh, research, again, same sort of deal, like just a bunch of, of researchers who get together and share information. But when it started, um, there was uh, one MD from India, you know, me, there were a few other women that we brought, you know, very, also very much at the beginning, and then a bunch of very old white men, you know, and when I said, you know, we got to do better, like at our first conference, like I was the only woman, and there wasn't anyone who wasn't, you know, presenting white, and I was like, we got to do better than this, guys, and they're like, when we were studying in the 1950s, this is who was at university, old white, or they were young white guys then, but that's who was there, so I really you know, they held open a door for me because I was like, I don't have the qualifications you guys have. And they're like, no, we want you in this. You know, you have something to offer here. And so someone held a door open for me. I hold the door open for other people. So I don't do um, that research myself, um, but I'm very big into the idea of uh, decolonizing mental health. And that means that I need to learn. I need to listen and I need to hear what other people do. So I work in complementary therapies. And these are the things that are not standard, either pharmaceuticals so psychiatry or traditional psychology talk therapies, right? Those there's research that's into that that does those things. And there are times when it's appropriate, but I, I think my opinion, underscore opinion, is there's too much emphasis on that. So one of the things that's happening, so one of the things about me, I've been sober um, for more than 25 years. And when I was first getting clean, and I share that because I want people to see that sobriety A is possible and B, you can have an amazing recovery. Like I travel the world talking about mental health, which is my passion, right? So, and I write award-winning books and I like this weekend, I'm going off to another city to do a book signing. Last weekend, I had a book signing in my hometown, right? So I get to do exciting things sober and I want people to know you can have a great life sober. But when I got sober, you know, there was 12 steps, and you know, not a lot else, you know, some psychotherapy to sort of help with it. And we didn't have really good, and I also have uh, trauma, and we didn't have really good therapeutics for that. Now, 25 years later, the push is to manage addiction as a chronic illness. Pharmaceutical companies are pushing for pharmaceuticals. Other people are pushing for with psycho forms of psychotherapy. But I'm like, guys, I recovered. I consider it an inter like a, 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 a in that there's been an intercession, right? Could I get it again? You know, if I started drinking, I don't have any desire to drink like a normal person, which is what they say in 12 steps. I don't want to have a glass of wine with dinner. Like that's boring to me. If I'm not like barfing on myself, peeing on myself, falling off of my chair drunk, I'm really not interested in drinking. And I know that about myself even now. So I don't try that experiment 
you know, I think some people probably, you know, maybe they can, I don't know, but that's not me. But I'm like, I've recovered from this. I've recovered. And I believe this kind of freedom is possible. And so I look at those therapeutics that will give you the skills to have that kind of freedom in your life. That's my interest. So a lot of addiction treatment centers, certainly not all, but a lot of addiction treatment centers, part of their business plan is relapse. When you relapse, you come back here and we'll treat you again and we'll treat you again and we'll treat you again and we'll treat you again. I think I heard Matthew uh, Perry after he passed um, that he spent something like $9 million oh, on treatment. Goodness. Well, if that's your, you know, your, your business model, it's a very good business model. But I worked in my first book, Ending Addiction for Good, I wrote that working for a treatment center where we, we never wanted to see you again because you were thriving in your life. Because we believed that there were plenty of people who have a substance abuse problem, and now it also treats uh, trauma and, and um, uh, we, we started treating trauma and other, other issues as well, um, not just substance abuse, uh, uh, gambling and sex addiction and all that kind of stuff. I never want to see you again because you're living an amazing life. And that's why I was brought on as the director of research for that institution since been sold. But for that institution at that time to research, what are the complementary therapies that we can use in addition to, because it's a treatment center. So, right, you're going to get psychotherapy and you're going to get psychiatry. And you're going to, you're going to get all those things. What else can we do so that when you leave here, right? Cause you're leaving anywhere between now seven days, they detox you and hit the door and say, do outpatient until you fail, right? Which is usually a relapse. Very often people die with, uh, you know, drugs like fentanyl, you die. But if you were leaving anywhere between, you know, seven and a hundred days, because this was a, a, a cash, when I was working there, it was cash. So you, people were staying long-term paying out of pocket. We want you to have what you need and the support that you need that you don't need us anymore. And we'll bring someone else in who needs that spot. That was that business model. So that's that worldview. And that's really what I work on are these changing your worldview so that you can have the life that you want. Yes. And what a beautiful approach. I love that. Not creating customers, which is really what it is, is creating customers. And they yeah, even yeah. now call them clients rather than patients. Yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. So alternative in a lot of places, yeah, or, or complementary. I've heard that term used before. Um, as a matter of fact, a previous podcast guest had had uh, taught me that word, and I loved it because it's true. Are you talking things like like EFT, like tapping? Are you talking, um, you know, Ho'oponopono Hawaiian healing? I mean, like, are you talking? No. So I really want to stay away from appropriating other people's traditions gotcha. because when we do that we usually mishandle them. So like when I would listen, when I, in the, in the early 1980s, I'm guilty of it, like, uh, or no, it, it, early 1990s, um, I, you know, worked at summer camps and outdoor schools. And, and because I, you know, taken a class in Native American studies, I did some, you know, sweat lodges, which with little, you know, with kids in outdoor school, it's about the building a fire, right? Because I was a Girl Scout, right? But I was told, here, you're going to teach sweat lodge. I'm Jewish. What do I know of sweat lodge, right? It was totally inappropriate. And so did I do it? Yes. Did I participate in that appropriation? I did because I didn't know better. You know, um, you know, one of my first is one of my first jobs, literally. And they're like, do sweat lodge. And I was like, well, I know how to build a fire. So I'm going to teach you how to build a fire. And I'm going to teach you about fire safety. And then we're going to read some Native American, you know, lore that I pulled out of a book and then we got in the sweat lodge it's so it's so dang hot and they're little kids like you know I'm lying on the we're in there 10 minutes it wasn't sweat lodge so I don't I don't I don't personally do that um because you know all we learned about sweat lodges is that some Native American communities use them and they're really hot and and if you don't have like someone who knows what's going on? I, I don't want to be in there. It's it's right. it's ridiculous. 
And then I took the kids, we took the kids swimming afterwards. Right. So it was more like, it was more like sauna and then <laughs> cold, you know, like Scandinavian was really what they got out of it. So complementary therapies. Yeah. Like, so like tapping, um, and, and, and so forth. Uh, I love acupuncture and acupressure, um, uh, yoga. When uh, I left the treatment center, I was looking at yoga specifically because every treatment center has yoga now. And, um, but why? Because when I've been into the, the rooms, the yoga rooms, I didn't see people really getting anything out of it. And what we learned in the research, and this is research that's mostly discounted because it comes out of India. The Indians are doing a lot of really good quality research about yoga. Why? Because they have a tradition of doing that. But, well, it didn't come out of one of our Western journals. I'm like, it's written in English. I could read it, you know, so I don't know. You know, look at their re look at the way they do their research. If they do it in a way that you b believe is appropriate, then why not accept it? So that's there's that kind of systemic racism as well. But what we learned about yoga is that it's the breath. It's not the poses. And if you look at like Yogi Bhajan and 3HO yoga, he had a um, an addiction treatment facility before his death. And uh, it was all about breath work. So th those are the kinds of things that we've learned in the research. The other thing we've learned um, I, in my last book, uh, and uh Rock to Recovery Music as a Catalyst for Human Transformation is about using music in um, addiction and trauma treatment. And what we've learned in music is that it lights up the whole brain. And when I first started getting involved in addiction research, I don't know, 15, 20 years ago, what we started getting at that time were fMRI scans. So we can actually see how these different therapeutics affect the brain and how the brain's involved. And so that's really opened up this, this idea of complementary therapies because what we find is, so for example, if you sing or play music, not listening to music, that has different effects. If you sing or play music, it lights up the whole brain and we have wonderful effects for several hours afterwards right because singing let's just use singing singing drops serotonin oxytocin and dopamine into the brain so if you or i are having a bad day and we hear a song that we like on the radio we're sitting in traffic and we hear a song and we sing along to it our own carpool karaoke right and we we're gonna feel better that's because our brains get a dump of serotonin, oxytocin, and dopamine, feel-good chemicals. Now, imagine you're five days in addiction treatment, and your brain, you've been, you're being detoxed, and your brain is not accustomed to you, those chemicals, right? Because you're getting them from the outside, right? You're, get, you're playing pharmacist with your brain. Your brain's not producing these chemicals. So you and I, we have a bad day. We're sitting here and our dopamine level jumps like this, right? Our, our serotonin oxygen. And we, so we get a mood lift like this. These people are so far in the basement that when, they're, when they sing and their brain dumps these chemicals, they get high. Best thing that can happen in an early days of addiction treatment is you give someone a natural high. You mean if I sing, I'm going to feel better? Well, people stay in treatment just to stay in that program that happens once a week. Yeah. Oh my gosh. It's right? so powerful. I, so these I, are the things, right? Yeah. But if you're selling drugs, and I don't mean if you're selling pharmaceuticals, <laughs> that's what I really meant to say. Not if you're the dealer on the street, but if you're selling right. pharmaceuticals, you don't want that research funded. Because if I teach you, right, I've just taught you in what, two minutes, that singing is going to help you. And you know this because you've sung along to the radio at some point and you felt better. Right? Why do people sing along to the radio? Because it makes them happier. You don't even have to be having a bad mood. Right? But I've taught you that in what now, 15 seconds. That just costs a pharmaceutical company a billion dollars because now I can teach you how to get better 
without pharmaceuticals. That's not to say that every condition can be treated without pharmaceuticals. That is not what I'm saying at all. But if your situation is just substance use, why are you doing that? You're doing that because you don't feel right, right? So if I can help you or others can help you to learn how to manage your feelings and feel your feelings, understand your feelings, then you don't need to be on. Because what happens is like people get on methadone for a long time. It used to be methadone. Now it's Suboxone, right? And you get on for a long time and they're like, you know, doc, I've been on Suboxone for three years and I don't feel good. Well, because you're not supposed to be on Suboxone for three years. It's supposed to help taper you off of the opioids. That was the intention of that drug. But if I can manage you and show research studies that say we can manage the drug addicts, right? Because it makes drug addicts dirty and stigmatized. And well, we'll just, you know, it's no different than methadone. It's just easier to take because I can give you, a, you know, a, a bottle of it and, and instead of you having to go to the clinic every morning. Right. Wow. So powerful. And, you know, as you spoke, so my mom was an addict my whole life, alcoholic. And um, her final, in 2019, 2019, uh, I was on vacation in Colorado and got the call. Hey, your mom's here detoxing at the hospital. We need someone to come pick her up. And I was like, I, I'm i in Colorado. I can't, She's she was in Ohio. I'm like, I, I cannot come pick her up in the next hour. <laughs> it's <not> right. <laughs> so I, at that point, I threw my hands up. Uh, my sibling threw her hands up and we both said, we're not doing this anymore. It, like, it was just that final straw. And we walked away from her for three months. And she finally, like, I, d- I put, I hung my superhero cape up, right? From that codependent relationship. And so anyway, she did the healing work. Like she, she went to two therapists and she finally started diving in and doing the work she, she needed to do. But it was interesting because I, of my research in the trauma recovery arena that when I finally reconnected with her and sat down and said, mom, like it's time to talk about your, your childhood trauma and the reason why you're diving into the bottle. Well, anyway, I swear to you, this is so crazy. She would want to sing songs. And so we would sit around and sing songs from my childhood, like crazy, silly, fun songs that I hadn't sung since I was a little kid. And I even have videotape recordings of her. She passed on my birthday this year Mm, um, in in March. But those, those, those moments of singing in joyousness. So she lived for three years sober At, at the end. She did dive back into the bottle when she found that she had liver cancer and cirrhosis, but um, it was so amazing. But I wish you talked, I was like, oh my gosh, my mom and I would sing songs along her recovery journey. And I just think that's so cool. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of benefits to sing. There's also uh, to, for people who are older or who have uh, different forms of dementias, um, listening to hearing songs from their youth actually can give them short bursts of uh, regular function. So like you'll see people, this is where I first started getting interested in music is um, hearing people who had Alzheimer's or other similar forms of dementia who would hear music from their youth and all of a sudden recognize where they were and the people around them, sometimes for several hours. But again, this is the kind of therapeutic that we came to, first of all, by accident, because some caregiver in a home somewhere thought it would be nice to play, you know, music from Belarus or wherever, you know, some patient was from. And they started seeing this, whoa, wait a minute. You don't have to have a master's or a PhD in music therapy to play a song for someone. Right. And so if we can expand who can provide these services and expand our definitions of appropriate services, we can reach more people. And I came to this 
because I was invited to speak in uh, South Africa by a friend of mine and uh, at, a, at a township hospital outside of Cape Town. And they brought everybody in to hear me speak, right? And I, you know, and I said, what do you want to hear? And she said, best practices. What are the, the newest, best things that we're doing? So I gave, got up there and it was an hour presentation. And for about 45 minutes, I talked about best practices. And this is what we're doing at the very expensive cash only boutique treatment center that I was working at, right? Where people can pay, you know, $100,000 for whatever, you know, service, I'd be like, okay, would you, do you take a check type of deal? Right. And so this is what I'm giving to this township hospital. And there was one physician, one psychiatrist who was white, everybody else was black. And this is, this is, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago. So this is well post apartheid, but there's one physician who's white and we're at the end and, you know, they get, round of applause. And I feel very, you know, I've done a great job. And uh, the one white doctor raises his hand when I ask for questions, he raises his hand. And I, I, I say that because I feel like he was the only one who felt like he could challenge me because I had been invited in and given a topic. I mean, I didn't just pull this out of the air. And he said, we have no psychotherapists or we have four psychotherapists in this region and we have none in the region to the north of us. So we can't do anything that, I mean, this is what, you know, that split second, I've just wasted all these people's time, right? But I lived in Kenya when I was an undergrad and I've lived in India. And, and so I'd had some experiences in other parts of the world. And I very quickly said, do you ever work with traditional healers, shamans, whatever, you know, you, you call them here? And everybody sort of leaned forward because those are the people traditionally, right, historically, who are tasked with dealing with mental health issues. And we got into this wonderful conversation about, okay, what are the principles of what I was talking about? Because what we've learned about the brain, I went, like I said, when I was just in Ecuador a couple of weeks ago, and I'm telling the show, I was like, well, we learned this about the brain, like how this he was, he was interested. It was a two-way conversation. Like he taught me how to make ayahuasca and I told him about brain research, right? Cause he doesn't have access to the journals. <laughs> he doesn't read English. So, you know, like we have these conversations. So it was like, okay, so what are the basic principles and how can we capitalize on that information? Right. So when I was in Namibia with the San, uh, you'd know them as the Bushmen of the Kalahari, right? Um, with San, and they're clapping and singing. And I'm like, oh, I know why this works. And when I get invited to Vietnam to some village out there, I can I can say, okay. These are the scientific principles from the West. This is what I've observed in Southern Africa. This is what I've observed in, you know, North American traditional communities. This is what I've learned from Pacific Islanders. What is appropriate to you? How do these pieces fit for you? Because like here in the United States, Native Americans hardly ever get any support for mental health. And when they do, and they walk into some therapist's office, who's usually very young and usually has little or no cultural understanding, they have one session and walk out. It's almost 100%. They don't come back. Well, why would they? I mean, you know, I went to a therapist once who was supposed to be very, very good for trauma. So I went to her and I said, I don't say cottage for my father's yard site. Well, she didn't know what a cottage or a yard site or a nothing was. And I spent the rest of the session educating her as to why this was important. And I never went back. Right. And I got it. I'm like, of course they don't. Yeah. Of course it doesn't work because it doesn't work outside of its context. Is, is that know? what you mean by the decolonization? Yes. Okay. Okay. So the only thing that is appropriate, and when I say appropriate, I mean paid for by insurance, not my, you know, not a judgment on my part, but what is appropriate 
are master's level and above, usually, although there are some exceptions, you could have like a drug counseling certificate, right, and lead some limited sorts of groups. It's mostly a master's level or above. You sit across away from them. You speak for 45 minutes or an hour, whatever your session is. There's no touching. There's no community. There's no, and then you go out in the world and you implement. Now, that's there are places where that works. I've been working with um, a woman who's relatively early in recovery. And I said, how's your, how's it going with your therapist? And she said, well, it doesn't really help with my addiction problem, but she does give, she has helped me to, how did she put it? She has helped me or she gave me the skills. I can't remember exactly how she said it to not punch my coworkers in the face. Okay, well, that's a useful tool. <laughs> that's a perk. <laughs> that's a useful tool. Like, well, if you're learning not to assault your coworkers, you should probably keep going. Like that's so I don't want to say that it it doesn't work or it's inappropriate or whatever. But you know, like we found with trauma, you know, I had some of the best therapy for 20 years and it didn't take a dent out of my trauma. And then I learned about somatics, which is the understanding that uh, trauma is stored in the body. Mm -hmm. And you see this in traditional, in, in traditional uh, healing and, and, and different communities. But as soon as I started doing somatic work, yeah. trauma resolved, I know. trauma re resolved, trauma in the Western, like in, in, Western circles is really not treatable. We try to manage it so that you don't kill yourself. To have complete resolution of my trauma symptoms blew my mind. But my practitioner, I, I believe she graduated high school. She didn't go to college. She's had specialized training in this. But insurance doesn't pay for it right. and won't pay for it. Now there are some treatment facilities that will have, will do somatics as part of what we call a bundle, but you have to do a whole bunch of this other stuff. So when you, when you bill for, uh, for addiction treatment and mental health and whatnot, they realize that there's time where you're going to eat there. You can't be in therapy, you know, seven hours a day. You have to have different things. So they just bundle everything together, and, but they have to have a certain number of, you know, therapeutic hours in there. So, you know, there are places that do it as part of a bundle, but I'm like, I work with veterans a lot. And I'm like, these guys need this. Mm. Yeah. But you can't get it. And so that's what, when we talk about decolonization, it's this Western institutionalized, predominantly um, in, you know, intellectualized, um, predominantly white view of the world. So if you change your story, your life changes. So and that's, re that's really, you know, where where I come in is with these with these complementary therapies. Hi everyone, Terry Welbrock here. Just wanted to take a pause mid episode to have a little conversation with Scott Summers here on Hilton Head Island, where I live. You know, I love to talk about healing resources, whether it's for um, emotional health, spiritual health physical health, we've tapped upon it all, and financial health. So we are going to talk about some financial health products. Retirement savings, I know that's another um, wonderful option for, for those with symmetry financial group. Yeah, I think one of the things I typically like to do is if I'm helping a family just with a basic life insurance policy or final expense or mortgage protection, I always let them know, you know, hey, the, the insurance carriers we work with can also help you with uh, preservation of your retirement assets. So the money that you've been saving up for all these years in your 401k, your TSP, um, you know, however you're doing that, your IRA, 
um, you can actually move those and change your strategy from all of your accumulation phase. Um, and when you start moving into that place where you're getting close to retirement and you don't want to have any risk at all, then you can actually work with the insurance carriers. You can move your income there, your money there for income later, but it's a total preservation tool. And so I always mention that on my insurance uh, meetings. And it's funny because when the market starts getting really erratic and the market starts going up and down, those are about the times I usually get the calls, you know. And, you know, um, when we do help uh, service clients with um, preservation tools like uh, some of the fixed index annuities that we work with or something of that nature, um, we uh, typically just hope that, you know, they hadn't taken a really big hit on their um, on their 401k or whatever, whatever way that they're saving. Um, but yeah, great tools. Uh, I've, I've had clients for you know, almost, almost a decade now. Uh, some of them now are in that phase where they're getting that lifetime income, income that you can't outlive too, you know, because uh, that money that you saved up, you can't count on that money when the, the market's going down and you're taking chunks out of that for income, you know, whatever the market does to it uh, can affect that income. So these products that we're working with have lifetime income riders that you can actually, you cannot outlive. You know, so if you have longevity, for example, you know, that could definitely be a concern. You don't want to have to change your lifestyle in retirement. Right, right. Wonderful. Well, everyone, thanks for, for listening in to our, our little, um, very informative, wonderful conversations with Scott Summers of the Summers Agency here on Hilton Head Island. And again, go to terrywellbrock.com. You can find out more information and click some tabs if there's anything specific you want to know about. And uh, um, I will be in touch with you. And yeah, now back to the show. Yeah, I know this will, would probably take us down a rabbit hole for days. Is there a solution? It, it, what can, I mean, somebody that's listening right now, I know me listening right now, like, what do I do? How do, how do I help fix it? Like, is, is it a matter of public policy? Is it a matter? It is a matter of public policy. And it's a matter of, you know, I often wonder if the issue isn't that we, um, public policy is tied up with, uh, campaign finance who gets elected and right now there is so much money the ins medical insurance you know and dominates mm -hmm. and so pharmaceutical companies dominate so people like me we can't break through like i don't work at a university because I don't publish, part of the reason is I don't publish in academic journals anymore. But the hierarchy at universities is based on tenure at the big institutions is based on which journals you've published in. But I don't publish in journals for a very specific reason, because that information rarely gets to the public. So I publish popular press books so that people, let's see if I can pull this out. So this was my book before my uh, uh, novel and it rocked recovery because I want you to know, public to know, singing makes you feel better. And there's an organization called Rock to Recovery. And of course, I support them. And I, I you know, I, I, I think that they belong in treatment facilities and I want to see more treatment facilities use them. But uh, there's only so many of these, you know, people. You, my opinion, because people get mad at me for this. My opinion is you don't need to be a master's level music therapist to write a song with someone in an addiction treatment center. That's so it, it's controlling market share. Right? If that's the if the only person who gets paid by insurance is someone who has a music therapy degree, which by the way is a minimum of eight years in college for that for that specific, well, then we don't have enough of those. Now it's great if you're a music therapist, and music therapists can do a very, very good job. But I want to make sure that everybody knows that your brain thrives when you sing, 
right? You don't need a master's degree or a PhD. So I don't put that into the journals because it has to go through this long process. And then everybody complains about it and nobody reads the thing, you know, and two years later, I've still got veterans who are killing themselves because we can't agree on whether or not the tech who's working with them can write the song. Right. So I don't participate in that. And so what you can do is you can, you know, seek out, cause I'm not alone in this. There are people all over, not only this country, but the world who are shouting from the rooftops. There are wonderful therapeutics available. Unfortunately, our system doesn't make them easy to find. Right. Or pay for. Or pay for. Yeah. Well, but I try to do things that are really low or no cost. Right. Good. Singing along to the radio costs yeah. you nothing. That book, you want that book? I always like it if you buy the book, if you can afford it. But if you can't, ask your library for it. Because not only can you read it, but also then your friends can read it. Right? That's that's what we hope. Listen, if everybody, if every library in the country buys my book, I don't have to worry about nothing. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Right. You know, th this is how you do it. By the way, I want to sing the praises of libraries because they don't only have books. My my library here in the little town that I live in, they have uh, dolls for kids that don't have dolls oh. that you can check out. Right. They have videos and 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 uh, CDs and audio books and they'll help you with your resume. If you don't have a resume, they have I mean, all sorts of things. So but, you know, in terms of so it's one place you can go for information. Neil Gaiman very famously uh, said, and I hope it's he, that he's the one who said this, but it's attributed to him. Um, Google can give you 100,000 answers but your librarian can give you the right one. So if you want to know about complementary therapies, that's one place to go is to your library and say, hey, librarian, I heard this podcast where this, you know, uh, crazy mental health researcher was, was saying that music really helps and be like, oh yeah, I've got a whole bunch of books, right? And they'll turn around and they'll be like, oh, here are the books about that. And she, well, she also said that breath work, oh yeah, there's all these books about breath work. So that, so, because there is a body of evidence, but most of us who are involved in that, right? Because, because if I say, you know, when I, I shout it from the, I'm like, I was, some guy taught me how to, like how, how they make ayahuasca. You can't say that in a room full of academics. Like that's discredited. What, what, what? Right. No, I, am I going to make ayahuasca? No, I am not. I do not have the ingredients. They do not grow in Washington state. It is too damn cold for them here. Right? Like that is not how that works. But that he was willing to share that information as a thank you for the information I was sharing. So I was with the um, head of a, of a, an Amazonian essentially village. They're kind of like, they call him the president. Oh. Um, He'd be, he'd be the, 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 they call him the village president. He'd be the mayor. Essentially, he'd be the mayor. Young man, uh, probably late 20s, early 30s. Um, and I said, you know, what do you do for, for mental health? And I was brought in by a community member. So I, I go and I, I meet, you know, and, and, and so this, this community member said, hey, you want to talk to this doctor? She's kind of, she's kind of neat. You know, she's not, she's not like the other people who come here and want to know stuff about us. Cause right. I don't come in with a clipboard and all that stuff. And, uh, he said, I said, well, what do you do for people who have mental health problems? And he straightens up and he says, we send them to the hospital in the town. And I was like, okay, so I know that's not true. Cause it's a three and a half hour boat ride, like in a dugout canoe, like in a motorized canoe. I'm like, that's that. So I said, okay, so before I don't say all that to him, right. That's, you know, yeah. but I know that's the truth. He's telling me the answer he thinks I want to hear. Right. And uh, I said, okay, so I get it. If there's a very severe case, I said, but before it gets to that point, I said, don't you have like, you know, a shaman, a traditional healer, whatever, you know, word you, you, you want to use for that. And he was like, yeah. 
And I said, you know, I'd done my research before. And I was like, well, don't you have these kind of, you know, these kind of community rituals based on connection? And he was like, yeah. He was like, do you want to talk to the shaman? And I was like, yes, please. And that's, a, you know, so we, we got to talk to him a, a little bit. They sent for him and they said, you know, get him, you know, everybody's got to come by canoe anyways. But uh, he, at the end of the conversation, he said, doctor, can I ask you a question? It's very embarrassing. You know, please, please. And he gets real quiet. My translator can barely hear him. I understand Spanish, but I, I always keep a translator to make sure that I'm understand cor perfectly, you know, because it's for research. So I want to make sure that I'm understanding perfectly and not mistranslating or misunderstanding or mishearing a word or whatever. And so she leans in and he says, I'm having trouble sleeping because at night I worry about my community and am I doing enough for them? He's like, do I need to go to the hospital? Do I need to see a doctor? Is this something really wrong with me? And of course, we want to, both of us like kind of want to titter, but we don't, right? How beautiful. And we're like, no, exactly the opposite. Exactly the opposite. That you care so much about doing a good job. This isn't a paid position, right? That you care so much about doing a good job for your community that it keeps you up at night is actually normal. And we would be concerned if you didn't. And then we taught him right in the middle of this, you know, field, there was, there was, a, they were doing this big cleanup project that they do once a year. So that's how we got to meet all these people. Anyways, but we happened to be there that day. We teach him grounding exercises. We're like, put your feet on the ground, breathe like this. And the shaman later was like, yeah, like totally, you know. So these are the things that, that we do in terms of having these, you know, these connections and teaching people these real skills. Teaching these skills because we've lost them. We've become disconnected. Everybody's got a phone, right? And doesn't know how to, you know, I've had a hard time. So my uh, Lisa, my my uh, staff, uh, uh, my intern that you that you spoke to, she's in South Africa, and and part of the reason I hired a South African is I wanted to hire a South African. But part of the reason I hired a South African is she has a lot of speaking skills that that a lot of, of younger people in the U.S. don't have, right? And so how do we get reconnected? Because addiction and trauma are not cured by addiction by abstinence, right? So I've abstained from drinking. But the problem of drink of my drinking is not the alcohol. Because when I stopped drinking, I should have gotten better, right? If you are um, bitten by a snake and I give you anti-venom, we remove the venom, what happens? You immediately get better. But you take the alcohol from someone who's been drinking for a long time. And what happens? They immediately get worse. And all sorts of psychological fragility and extreme feelings and outbursts and all sorts of things. So I know the problem is not just the alcohol. Alcohol is the solution to the problem. How do people get better? They get better through connection, right? So we had all these rat studies. If you put a rat, uh, very briefly, if you put a rat in a cage by itself and you put in cocaine, water, heroin, water, whatever, alcohol, whatever drug you want, the rat will drink itself, use itself till it dies. It'll use everything and everything and everything and it'll die. And so these, these rat studies were done and people were like, wow, these things are really bad and really addictive and people should be very careful. But then another guy came along and he said, Maybe the problem is you have the rats in solitary confinement. So he made a rat paradise and he, and rats are very social. So he put a lot of rats in there. So they had rat playtime and play dates and, you know, they could go to the dance and they had toys to play with and they had food and they had mazes and they had all the things rats would want. And they had their drug water, heroin, cocaine, alcohol, whatever you want to put in there. When they have connection, they don't drink themselves to death. 
connection is a curative. So when I go out to all these places and observe and get invited in, it's been so beautiful to be invited in, right? To, to see what people do. It's always in connection. What are the, what, I, I have yet to meet an indigenous group to heal a person that sends them off by themselves. Now there are, there are certainly rituals that you do go by yourself on a thing, but they're not the healing rituals for, for addiction, for example, that's connection. Suicidality, you don't send someone off by themselves. That's not what we do. When people jump off, want to jump off a bridge, this is anecdotal, and you've seen pictures where someone will come up behind and grab them and say, I'm not letting go. Those people don't come back two weeks later and jump off the bridge. Because the lie we tell ourselves when we're suicidal is that you, royal you, whoever you are, are better off without me, that I am a burden, you don't need me, I harm you, whatever that negative story is, but you are better off without me, which is never true. So when so, when we, you know, want to talk someone off the ledge, right, that's the, the phrase that's used, and they have a good relationship with mom or dad, we always bring mom or dad. It's not true. You are not better off with, we are not better off without you, right? And so this connection is so important. It's the same thing with uh, with babies uh, from, you know, uh, uh, remember, I want to say this was the 80s, but the this, this touch starved babies from Romania, oh, right? Yeah. That were, there were so many orphans, right? And they were just in these cradles and they weren't touched and there were lifelong deficits because of the lack of touch. And the lack of connection. And we see that all over the place. So connection is what's actually curative. So back to your question, you know, a couple of questions ago, what do we do is we have to demand that policies be written that actually support healing. And we can't do that with a government system that is broken to the point that nothing comes out. I mean, I don't even care if it's a policy. I don't agree. I mean, nothing. We can't get a budget passed. It took three weeks to get a speaker. I mean, nothing comes out. So that, I think it's that system that has to be addressed kind of first. Meanwhile, since there's, seems to be no movement on changing that system. Meanwhile, we have to advocate for ourselves and research for ourselves and and find people like me because I don't I I don't take client. I don't use the word patient because I don't believe that you're sick, like in that medical diseased way. I think you've got an issue that needs to be addressed and you probably need uh, your community of support to do that. I don't, I don't see clients because I'm not licensed that way, but I got a Rolodex, right? I know people and I know, you know, who, who does what, where, and I know where to look, right? That's why I say a librarian is going to, they don't have a Rolodex, you know, they have, you know, we used to call it a card file. Now it's, you know, it's just a, a database, right? right? But Right. But they know where to look to find the people like me. Right. Who are going to point you in the direction. You know, like I said, I worked with a lot of musicians, rock stars, if you will. And, uh, you know, they'll call me and say, OK, we got a guy who's, you know, whatever. And I'm like, all right. Or a fan will come up to someone backstage and I'll get the call, you know, of. All right. We got a. 27 year old woman with two children in in uh outside of nashville or outside of chattanooga and she can't go because there's no one to take the kids oh no i got a place you want to go to chattanooga or you want to go to nashville because she's somewhere in between i got a place take her take her today that's the other problem is that we don't have enough beds yeah. so 
so how this is what I like what I learned in South Africa. OK, we don't have beds. We don't have practitioners. We don't have we don't have whatever, whatever the person needs help now. So how do we flex? How are we flexible? How do we change what we do? There was a, a guy in uh, Zimbabwe who uh, had uh, he, he was seeing a lot of problems and a lot of mental health issues and he had a tiny budget tiny budget <laughs> and he said i see that there's a lot of elder this is when aids has ravaged the country right so we're missing a whole generation and we've got old people and young people and kind of nothing in the middle and he said i see these old people who are lonely and i see these younger people who don't have anyone to talk to so he used his little budget to buy benches and he did a few hours of training because if there's one thing old people know how to do, it's listen and talk, right? And it was the grandmother benches. Oh. I believe he only used women. And he put out his eight or 10 benches, whatever they were around different places in, in his city and let people know, come and talk to the grandmas. And they saw a tremendous decrease in mental health issues because we have to understand mental health issues predominantly, not all, but predominantly are responses to some sort of social ill. So people say, wow, there's a lot of, of suicide, right? I'm, there's a group in North Kenya that I've worked with and known about for many, many years since I lived in Kenya who's seeing suicide and groups around them, suicide at a rate they've never seen before, especially with young men. Because of desertification and climate change, and they literally can't eat. There is nothing left. Mm -hmm. Well, if you literally, it's suicide or just starve to death, like, a, a, like, Addressing suicidality is not the issue there. We're, you know, it's being framed in the West as well. It's a mental health issue because they're killing themselves. No, it's a, it's a climate change issue. And how do we make sure that these have are viable communities that have food? That's if we if we address food insecurity in that region. I am 100% convinced that suicide rates will plummet because we frame the question incorrectly. So that's what, what we need to do here is to say, what's the real issue? Why do I need mm -hmm. to drink? I needed to drink because I had underlying trauma and it drinking made me feel numb. I would feel my finger and it would feel like wood. And I was like, yeah, that's what I want. I want to feel nothing. Yeah. And that would have worked for me because there wasn't good trauma treatment back in those days. That would have worked for me, except that using two liters of alcohol a day has some pretty significant physical consequences. Right. And I could not keep doing both of those things. Once I got trauma treatment, I don't think about drinking anymore. Like once I got that trauma treatment, I'm like. Yeah, that's what happened with my mom. Like. Once she started releasing all of that unresolved childhood, particularly her childhood trauma, that she had never told anyone. And here she was, 82 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. I mean, just the healing leaps and bounds that occurred. When I started somatic experiencing, when I started somatic therapy, I dropped 75 pounds and have kept it off for five years now. I did not change my diet. I did not change my exercise. I did not change anything. I just didn't need that protective barrier because the person who assaulted me said, I don't want to have sex with fat women. I was like, good information. But once I, A, heard here, not just I heard it a lot, but heard here, right, in my heart, under, like, felt that's not true. 
and started to move the trauma out, I just didn't need the extra weight and it left. And that is not unusual. But who gets paid for that? Nobody. Right, right. So like my research is, it's so hard for me. I have to do a GoFundMe for my research. I'm buying my, my airline tickets on miles that I got when I worked at a previous job that, you know, because, well, what's your return on investment? My return on investment is healthy people. It's people not suffering. It's people not killing themselves you know, and I give the, I give the book away, right? I just gave some books away yesterday to book signing because the people can, I'm like, okay, you can't afford it. Great. You're here in front of me. You showed up. Here you go. Get right. it from the library. I want you to have the information. I mean, I still need to eat. I still need to pay for the, you know, the hotel when I go to the, you know, to the Amazon, like, you know, you got to pay for the, the campsite sort of deal. It's still, but I don't need to make a billion dollars like a drug company needs to. I don't have investors who are waiting, you know, for their dividends. I just want people to get better. And that is not the way our system works. Our system is capitalist. And you don't make any money investing in decreasing human suffering. Right. But I'm going to keep writing the books until I can't eat anymore. And then yes. I'll get a regular job. <laughs> On that note, shoo, I told you we could go down a rabbit hole. I, I need to have you like, we just didn't need to do a series because I could just listen to your wisdom and brilliance. Just amazing. So it's all good. Uh, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your insights. So how, how do folks connect with you? How do they find your books? So my book, everything's on my website. It's constantsharf dot uh, dot com. Um, I'm on all the socials, uh, threads, X, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. It's all um, at uh, dr doctor. You know, uh, Sharf. So you can get me at all those places. Wonderful. All right. Well, again, thank you for sharing your. Just amazing insights. I know I've learned a lot. You've seen me just sitting here shaking my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to. I just. I, I want to share, and I. I want to help, and and you know, like I say, you know, I, I. I get a percentage of some of the books, and my first book isn't even in print. You got to buy it used, and still get it if if it's going to help you. Because I. I don't care. I don't see any money. I don't care. I want you to live a better life. Because I thought I was going to die. I thought that the only way for me to live was to drink two liters of alcohol a day. And by 23, I was dying. Yeah. And then I found recovery and I've spent my life trying to spread that, that you can recover and have an amazing life. Because every breath I've taken for the last 25 years is gravy. I should be dead by now by the numbers. I should be dead by now. And yet everything I've ever wanted to do has happened. And you can have that kind of recovery too. It is available to you and I want you to know it. So, you know, if you want to reach out to me, please do. Awesome. And I say amen to all of that. So, all right. Well, everyone, thanks for joining us today on the Healing Place podcast. And remember until next time, be gentle with yourself. Thanks. Bye-bye. Hey, everybody. Terry Welbrock here. Just wanted to thank you again for being a part of this healing space and my Hashtag hope for healing journey. Thank you for sharing, liking, inviting others to join, listening in. Uh, you've really helped this show blossom. It has now been downloaded in 136 countries and is in the top 2% globally out of 3.2 million shows, which is just amazing. And it's all because of you and your tuning in and inviting others and sharing and liking and loving and your reviews on apple really help too my goal is to hit 100 five-star reviews uh, by the end of the year 
And I am closing in on that. So if you are listening in on Apple or Apple Podcasts, please go and rate the show and leave a review if you absolutely love it. And uh, I would be most appreciative. Also, if you would like to receive my monthly Hope for Healing newsletter, please be sure to go to terrywellbrock.com. It's T-E-R-I, just one R, W-E-L-L. B R O C K dot com. And I have a uh, a gift to send you for signing up for that monthly Hope for Healing newsletter. Plus, there are many other resources listed on that page, including a resource library. All right. Thanks. Bye bye.